Falling short. Issues of Uncle Jay. Waste man, I said, catching the attention of Carl, a 22-year-old mentee, in the tone of our usual banter. Carl, about to graduate with a degree in law, was staying with me because he had to move out of his house share for a variety of reasons. I said he could stay with me until he got into the group of getting a job and saving some money. What is it, old man? replied Carl as he paused the TV show he was watching on his laptop while lying on his bed. Tell me if I'm right in this scenario, I responded. Go on, said Carl, now going into pastor mode. Earlier today, I headed out to training in somewhat of a hurry because I was late. I started. Yes, I saw. Go on, said Carl. So I get to my car, which is parked where the next door church is having some kind of family fun day. Okay. I get into my car, which is situated in a spot where I have to do a U-turn, in the midst of a lot of cars parked closely together, to get onto the quickest route to training. Uh-huh. While doing a U-turn, my car gently kisses another. Okay. As I complete the turn, I'm about to drive off. A slightly elderly man literally gets in front of my car to stop me, which of course causes me to get out and engage him. Excuse me, but are you aware you hit this car? said the man to me. I wouldn't exactly call that a hit, I responded. But you left a mark, insisted the man. Where? I asked. I kid you not, Carl. This guy, this guy searched to show me something that barely qualified to be a scratch. Are you the owner of the car? I asked, ready to exchange insurance details and to be done with it. No, he replied. Do you know who owns the car? I asked. No, he replied. At which point I got into my car and drove off. I finished, causing Carl to laugh a little. Tell me, bruv, am I wrong for driving off? Episode 3. Dishonesty. Extremely fake. They laugh when they don't even understand the joke. They ask for a lighter and they don't even smoke. They dance to music which they can't fathom the beat. They claim to be courageous but when trouble comes they retreat. They pretend to be clever but haven't got a clue. They try to be funny but end up looking the fool. They are easily taken in by what other people think. That's why in times of stress mentally they sink. No matter what shape or form they may take, I can't stand people who are extremely fake. The truth is, if you were to chart most of my interactions from day one of my existence, I can only describe myself as a dishonest person. And I say that because before looking into why I've been dishonest in the past, I remember being around one or two years old. At this point, not really affected by the neglect and the little abuse I had been exposed to and seen a pack of chocolate biscuits in the living room. Naturally, as a toddler with a sweet tooth, I wanted to help myself to a biscuit or three, but I knew I wasn't allowed to. I wrestled with the temptation of taking these biscuits with images of hell from a pamphlet fresh in my mind. And in the end, I took the biscuits. This clearly ties into the fact highlighted by the Bible that a man's natural disposition is to give in to sin. Pre finny days, for the most part, I wasn't really dishonest, despite stealing the odd Lego man from school here and there. But overall, I was somewhat content, in the sense I didn't feel like I had to impress anyone, or like I was lacking, even though looking back, it, it was clear my mother was struggling financially. I had enough encouragement from teachers at school, I was happy with my own company, along with the few friends I had made. However, once I entered into the finny aspect of my childhood, being dishonest, particularly with the habit of telling lies, was for me a means of trying to fit in and survive. One could say being dishonest for the most part was a defense mechanism. There I was, being mistreated for really no reason. If I lacked knowledge of any kind, I was either ridiculed or physically attacked. For instance, I remember being ridiculed by my cousins at the age of seven for not being able to pronounce Margaret Thatcher properly. Instead, I would say Margaret Thatcher. Or instead of saying Federal Bureau of Investigation, I would say Federal Bureau of Investigation. If I struggled with my schoolwork in any way, I would be flogged by teachers and tutors. I remember doing badly in a test and my teacher beating me badly and then spending a good 15 minutes telling me how worthless I was. A message I would be further reinforced by my uncle and cousins. Looking back, I have to say all in all, I was a good kid. Happy-go-lucky with a desire to be friendly with people around me. But in return, it seemed like the world was against me for just being me. I remember being given what to me at the time, quite a bit of money for my 10th birthday. 
and my cousin Ore, who was 17 at the time, taking the money from me for what she called safekeeping. I couldn't ask for access to my own money because in that house I was a second class citizen, so I stole some of it from her room. Naturally, I was caught and beaten for it. So in my head, I felt telling lies and stealing was the only way to improve my situation. So I became that guy in school who would lie or exaggerate all the time. And as the years went by, the habit just stayed with me, to the point that over time I created countless prisons for myself. Now I have that truth that I can achieve things, and that as a person like everyone else, I'm priceless, even if I don't achieve anything in the eyes of man. One could say I've wasted a lot of time on opportunities, but you can also say it is a process I had to go through. And link that notion to Romans 8 verse 28, which says, And we know that in all things, God works for good of those who love him. My Anime Life, Episode 3 After ensuring the little girl was cleaned, properly clothed and fed, Jay and his new traveling companion took on a two-day journey on foot to an orphanage he had walked by in the past, deep in the countryside. The girl didn't speak, but showed interest every time Jay played his harmonica when they stopped to rest. Good day. I was hoping you would take this girl in, said Jay, as a young Ethiopian-looking woman answered the door of the modest-looking orphanage after he knocked. I'm sorry, this isn't the right place for her, said the woman with her eyes filled with fear. Denise, who is at the door? asked a larger and older Ethiopian-looking lady. Sorry, auntie. This gentleman wanted to leave this young girl in our care, responded the young woman, quickly hiding the concern previously on her face. Is that so? Both of you come in, said the woman, then leading Jay and the little girl through a hall, filled with happy children playing, into a small office that screamed childcare. My name is Sandra, the manager here. How can I be of assistance? asked the woman, as she sat behind her desk. Jay proceeded to take a seat and the little girl did the same. There was then silence for about 20 seconds as Jay stared at Sandra with a blank look. Sorry about that. Every now and again I zone out, Jay said, suddenly falling back into his previous pleasant demeanor. I understand. Like I said to Denise earlier, I wanted to leave this girl in your care. Has she recently been orphaned? I don't know actually. I only recently freed her. I see. I will ensure she is well taken care of. Thank you. Jay then got up to leave and the little girl held his hand with a look that said, Don't go. Jay responded by bending down and handing her his harmonica and kissing her on the forehead. Later that evening, when all the children were in bed, Sandra approached Denise, who was folding clothes in the laundry room with her back turned. Why did you tell the gentleman earlier that this isn't the right place to leave a little girl? asked Sandra. It seemed like we were at full capacity and I don't lie to me. Denise then paused for a moment before turning to face Sandra. I know. You know what? I know you sell children that come here into slavery. The last time I checked, slavery was legal in this land. It's not right. We we're meant to be helping them. Don't be so naive. How do you think we pay for all this? There has to be another way. The only other way is if you leave. A knock on the door suddenly interrupts their conversation. Sandra opens the door and her henchmen, now unconscious, are thrown at her feet. In another life, reading and observing people was my full-time job. I don't usually throw the first punch, but in situations like these, I tend to fall off the wagon, said Jay in his usual calm tone. What is the meaning of this? As you can see, I took out your man in charge of picking up unaccompanied children and your man in charge of selling them, through whom I identified and took out all your clients. What do you mean took out? Let's just say they will need rehab for a while. Jay then proceeded to throw a pistol at the feet of Sandra. I don't feel comfortable killing an unarmed woman, said Jay as he stared intently at Sandra. All I was trying to do is survive, said Sandra to Denise, before picking up the pistol and shooting herself in the head. Falling Short Complete Series can be found on Jumash Studios' YouTube channel. Falling Short is also available in paperback book format or on Kindle.
To get your copy, email jamarstudios at gmail.com. That's jamarstudios at gmail.com. 